Well, good day, everybody. This is Joe Van Cleve, and today I would like to talk about the historical precedent uh, of photography, and specifically the use of optics to create images prior to the era of chemical photography. So stay tuned. You know, there's a lot of talk today in the photography world about the role that lenses play in forming uh, photographic images and specifically certain attributes of lenses such as narrow depth of focus, what we might call bokeh. Um, and a lot of people tend to nowadays base their whole photographic uh, equipment on the ability to get uh, narrow depth of focus and bokeh. I think it's interesting uh, that this has happened because biologically uh, the human eye and brain combination, we don't really notice bokeh in our natural vision. We, the, the way the lens of the eye tends to focus uh, automatically without thinking about it, either at near or far distances, and then the way the brain, the visual cortex, puts all that together into a coherent image, we tend to see things that are sort of equally focused all the time. I mean, you can do little, little games like put a finger up in front of your eye, and you'll see the eye is, or the finger is uh, softly focused if you're, if you're focusing on some distant object. Or if you focus close in to the finger, you'll see the, the uh, background is rather soft. But you won't really necessarily notice bokeh effects directly. I think it's interesting, though, that, um, that we have come to this point as in photography where we do notice optical effects. And it seems that nowadays most of us tend to think of photography and optics as being simultaneous. Uh, they're being almost the same thing. That the idea of the optical effects of an image forming system is the same thing as photography. Uh, historically that hasn't always been true however because lenses and what were called camera obscuras were being used centuries before the uh, early 19th century when uh, the chemical means of fixing an image was first developed. So there has been this idea that arose within the last uh, several decades that optical aids might have been employed by famous painters in the uh, post-Renaissance era to help them in composing uh, realistic scenes. And uh, probably the, the one uh, most striking work that brought this to the popular public uh, eye was this book, Secret Knowledge, by David Hockney. Um, in, it, in the book, David talks about his theory that some of the famous painters such as Caravaggio and others used um, either lenses or curved mirrors to project images of objects or people seated or posed onto a canvas upon which he could then draw and paint uh, their image. And I think it's a real interesting idea. Uh, it has some merits, I believe. Um, and of course, in this book, he extensively covers um, the history of painting and realistic painting and talks about how there appears to have been a certain time where uh, painting became much more photographic not only in its realism and its perspective, but uh, in, in a sense of uh, there's sort of in this, this implicit uh, sense of optical projection that, in, that works in some of these uh, uh, paintings. Now, one of the um, devices that came about uh, a few centuries ago was called a camera lucida. And this, cam this is a photograph of David Hockney sketching from a camera lucida and what you're seeing there is it's a little mechanical arm that has a prism like device and you look down upon your paper uh, through the prism and what you're seeing superimposed on the paper is the image of a seated person or figure or scene in front of you. So the painter, if I was the painter or sketcher, I would have a figure, a person, a, a, a posed in front of me fairly well lit and then I would have my paper down here and I would be looking through this prism like device and I could see my hand and I could see the paper what I was drawing 
down there, but I also see superimposed on it the real life image in front of me. Um, so this is just another simple example of how uh, artists might have used optical-like devices for uh, for aiding their their sketching and painting, and um, and so this is all pre-photographic in a sense, right? It, it's not using light-sensitive materials to capture an image. It is using optical means to either pr directly project an optical optical image upon a surface or to see a virtual optical image in the case of the camera Lucida. Now, the camera Lucida, there's an interesting um, uh, part of my growing up years that relates to this. My, my grandfather on my dad's side, so this would be Otto Van Cleef, and uh, he was, po he, he loved ordering mail order stuff. And one of the things that he ordered was this see and draw copier. Look at that, see and draw copier. And this is basically a modern uh, recreation of a camera Lucida. There's a little instruction thing on the back. And there's a little base with an arm and a little mirror device. And you look down through it, and this box is all falling apart. I, I've had this since I was a young boy, and my grandpa had ordered it back in the late 1960s from who knows where, some kind of optical catalog. But it has this heavy weighted base, and I, I thinking, I'm thinking there's some parts probably missing on missing from it. But anyway, there's there is this padded felt bottom, and there's this bracket here with some clips. And I think there's a little box part of it that used to go on here that's missing. But I, I basically just attach the arm like this, and then this upper part here, you have this mirror box. And what you have is you have a peephole on the top and a partially, it's not really a partially silvered mirror, I, I think it's a clear piece of glass and then there's a mirror behind it and this is all real dusty I know. But you basically fit this, there's a slot in the side and you fit it on the arm like this, something like this. Or maybe you do it on the other side is probably what you do. You use the long arm. Anyway, yeah, the long arm goes like that and then the short part of it goes on the base, something like this. And so you can sit this down and have a piece of paper right here and you look down through it and you see a superimposed image. Like for instance behind the camera in my windows with my, with my blinds in my office here and I can see clearly the image of the windows and I can see the trees outside beyond the blinds, beyond the window. And if you keep this very steady and keep your eye in the same place on here, you can definitely sketch, uh, you know, you have a frame of reference for sketching that image. So that's an optical device that it doesn't really form a real image, it more like forms a virtual image on your paper. But an optical device for seeing uh, an optical representation of reality that you can use to record an image via painting or sketching. Now, one of the most popular methods f that artists used after the era of lenses were discovered, after the Dutch invented the, le the lenses, at least in the modern era, was um, to build what was called a camera obscura, which is a Latin phrase meaning dark chamber. Um, and so a camera obscura, is they came in various uh, sizes. You, some of them were actually entire rooms or cabinets or closet kind of devices that you could actually go into and project an image onto a wall to either paint or sketch. But uh, many of them were portable devices, handheld or little boxes that you would take out into nature, set it up on a stand or a tripod, and you could use it to sketch or draw. Um, so I got interested in this and the idea that um, optics uh, could be employed directly as a viewing device, absent the mediation of photographic light sensitive materials. Um, I think it's interesting how uh, when you look into a device like a camera obscura, you can see all the optical artifacts of a lens. You can see the limited depth of focus. You can see the effects of focusing the device near and far. Um, you can see the out of focus areas, the in focus areas. You can see the effects of different aperture sizes on the depth of field. 
Uh, you can see the optical aberrations that may be present on the lens around the edge of the image. All of these things are present in um, with a with a camera obscura, all depending on how well designed and manufactured the lens is. Uh, so I got interested in maybe building a little handheld camera obscura device just to practice looking out at scenes photographically. Let me show you what I come up with. So what I did was I had an old lens. Uh, this is a Kodak Ektar 135, 135mm f5.6 lens from an anniversary speed graphic. I had issues with the shutter being um, when it would close sometimes the blades would partly stay open and it would fog the image. So it wasn't really reliable of a shutter anymore for use with photography, but it still projects a very nice image and uh, it is a pretty high quality lens for its day. So I made this box and what it is, it has a viewing hood, this black craft paper and um, gaffer's tape viewing hood that you can gaze down onto. Let me pull the viewing hood off like that. And what we have on the inside, a little dust, of course, is we have a box within a box. So let me pull the outer box off. More dust. So what I have is a foam core, uh, black foam core box that is glued together with hot glue gun and black gaffer's tape. My lens board uh, for my speed graphic lens is just mounted on the inside with some tape and what I have on the other side here This is a front surfaced mirror that was taken out of an old projection television Remember those big old boxy projection televisions that used three separate little CRTs and it projected an image inside the box against the rear screen Well, this is one of these front surface mirrors and uh, so I have the front surface mirror mounted here at a 45 degree angle. And then what I have is I have an outer box that slips over the inner one. And the outer box uh, has, of course, four walls. And it has the front is cut out so that it will go over the front lens board like this. And what I have on the inside of it is the ground glass view screen is a piece of maybe eighth inch uh, lucite plastic and what i've done to make it into a ground glass view screen the rough side here is i ground it down with 400 grit uh, sandpaper on a random orbital sander so uh, the random orbital sander polishes it down into a rough kind of a ground glass effect and then you mount that there and the way this works is I can focus the image on the ground glass by altering the height of the outer box. This is basically how it focuses. So you look down through the viewing hood, the viewing hood just shields it against uh, stray light and you focus the image like that and you have a very nice quality square format image and if you want to you can also adjust the aperture uh, it's wide open here at f5.6 it'll go all the way down so far that it'll be very very dark and it'll be difficult to see but as far as how close does it focus uh, lift it up about this <coughs> this far <coughs> I'm focusing on the video camera screen which is about two feet away I'd say so within 24 inches of focus I can get to well, so what I've done, I've come out to my backyard and I have the little camera obscura sitting on my little workbench stool. And we're just going to do a little bit of uh, focusing tests and see what it looks like. So we're looking down in uh, to the viewing hood toward the ground glass. And what you're looking at is you're looking at through the trellis toward the far side of my yard. And you can see through the grid of the trellis, you can see the... Uh, the distant tree and the wall and all that are fairly sharply defined. And now, if I pull the view screen up, you can see how I can focus now onto this near support beam on my trellis. And now the background is out of focus. I have a little light baffle that's designed to prevent fogging when you raise this up, but it only goes so far before you start getting fogging, like right there. But so that's focused in close, and then we can 
push it down and focus toward the background again pull focus toward the foreground and then go back and focus toward the background again so we have these very definite optical effects that we can perceive in this camera obscura there's kind of an almost meditative peacefulness to coming outside into nature with this little simple optical device and just gazing down through it and looking at scenes and looking at how they look optically when you project them via a lens. It's kind of an interesting experience. Um, something that we definitely take for granted in this day and age of in, of ubiquitous uh, digital photography and cameras being embedded in all of our devices. And there is one of my lights in my studio. Uh, so it's an interesting device. Uh, you might ask yourself, so what's what really what's the purpose of building this? Well, obviously, uh, you could look at it as a historical curiosity, right? What is a small portable camera obscura? What were they like? How easy were they to build? How easy were they to carry around different places? Could you actually use them for drawing or sketching or doing visual studies of scenes? And the answer to all that, of course, is yes. It is fairly easy to build. Uh, you know, this was just a uh, foam core board, nothing fancy like woodworking. Uh, obviously, I'm using a lens that's probably a much better quality than what was available several hundred years ago, but uh, even a more primitive lens can still project a pretty decent image. Uh, there's another aspect to this, though, that I found was kind of interesting, which is it's the idea of using um, a device like this uh, not as a substitute for a camera, but more like a device to help a person to uh, learn to see photographically. It's a viewing device. You can take this out, let's say, with a chair, and you can sit down somewhere, and you can set it on your lap, and you can look down in it, and you can kind of study what things look like optically when projected onto a two-dimensional surface, like the view screen in the camera here. And... I think it's an interesting uh, uh, device to experiment with vision, with learning how to see photographically, learning how three-dimensional images get projected f down into flat two-dimensional images. And it kind of informs us about how uh, the world of art and painting and imaging uh, was explored back several hundred years ago. I think it's a it's an interesting device, uh, especially in light of today uh, with our incessant, ubiquitous uh, photographic devices that are built into our phones, our mobile devices, and everywhere you go, there's a little camera somewhere. It's interesting how uh, you, can, you can see the basic optical principles of the camera at work in, an, in a uh, device as simple as this. So... This is Joe Van Cleve, and uh, this is my little portable camera obscura. And until next time, have yourselves a great day.